Okay, so in this lecture, I want to say a little bit more about the individual premises of the simulation argument, in particular, one specific premise um, that we haven't looked at yet, you know, the first premise, actually, that I actually have quite a lot of doubt about. Just say a little bit about it and the general argument itself. Okay, so as we've seen, you know, we looked at premises three, uh, two through four, and as we've seen, there's room for doubt on all of them. Now, Bostrom doesn't seem to think that any of them are very dubious. He doesn't think they're a sure thing, but he thinks they're very likely except for premise four, right? And he'd say, well, look, you should want premise four to be true because if the odds are really low, that civilizations last to this technologically advanced point. If those odds are really low, then we're probably all going to die, or at least, you know, you know, civilization will at some point. So, I mean, you might put it in, if you want to just sum it up a very neat way, you might say, well, either we're probably living in a simulation or we're doomed. If the odds are really, really high that civilizations make it through this stage, and get to the technologically advanced point, then the argument goes, and we're probably living in a civilization, uh, simulation, at least Bostrom would say, right? If the odds they make it through are really low, then, well, we might not be living in a simulation, but our odds of making it through are also really low. So we should root for the simulation, or so says Bostrom. But I'm not sure we should accept that premises two or three are as likely as Bostrom seems to think, right? You know, premise two that, you know, they will get to the point, any civilization that advances will get to the point where they'll create, you know, these simulations or can create them. He, you know, I'm not sure that we should be so sure that those si simulations are really possible. Maybe computers will never get to that point, maybe they can't, right? And even if they do, it might turn out to be really, really hard to do a simulation that involved. Maybe it's possible, but if it's possible and there's only two or three of them around, well, you know, then it's like we're one, you know, there's three, sim there's two simulations in the real reality, our odds get a lot better, right? Or it might be so hard to do that nobody thinks it's worth doing, even if they could do it, right? You know, I'm going to guess if, you know, if we had to, we could probably get to Mars with current technology. Decent chance we would kill some people, right? We'd take a lot of money. We could probably do it, but we haven't because it's not worth it, right? If it were possible to create a simulation, but it took something like 60% of your gross domestic product to do it, well, most countries, most civilizations would just say that's not worth it, right? What possible use could we have for this that's worth that? So I think Bostrom needs to assume not just that it's possible, but that at one point this will get to be really, really easy. Otherwise, even if there's good reason to create simulations, there won't be many of them because it'll have to be very good reasons, it'll be hard to do. And it might just be that they're none, even if it's possible, because you'd need really, really good reasons, right? All right. But I think the biggest assumption here, honestly, is premise one. Two and three don't seem to me as likely as Bostrom thinks, but I actually think they're, they're fairly likely. I'm pushing back them a little harder than I actually believe. To me, though, premise one is probably the biggest assumption of all. We've already talked about this a little bit in personal identity and with Liu's story, but I think more needs to be said on this, right? A good simulation of the conscious mind would probably be conscious. Is this true? Any machine that can simulate our consciousness probably has consciousness, right? When we talked about the Turing test, that was the big assumption there. Just, you know it's conscious if it can simulate conscious consciousness convincingly, 
Many people seem to assume this is true. Should we really assume that this is true, though? Isn't it honestly kind of weird to assume that a simulation of a thing will produce the thing it simulates? Isn't that an odd assumption? Right? You know, we talked about this before. If I, you know, if for some reason I had a computer program running on my computer that could perfectly simulate the weather, right? Predict the weather three weeks from now. Well, that would be amazing, but I wouldn't have to worry about it creating rain in my house or wind, right? A simulation of the weather does not create the weather. You know, you cannot eat the vegetables you grow in Farmville, right? Even if it were a way better, and I'm guessing if it were better, it would also be a way more boring simulation of actual farming. Simulated farming does not create real vegetables. And this is the point that John Searle made. Consciousness is a property of biological organisms, right? As far as we know. Why would we think something made of silicon or any other material that a computer might be made out of would have consciousness? I mean, think of it this way, right? Wind and rain and all the stuff that makes the weather are a product of the air and everything that goes into it, right? The atmosphere. Simulations of all that stuff in a computer in silicon are not going to create wind or rain or any of that because wind or rain is something that occurs in a different kind of thing than silicon computer chips, right? It occurs in the air. A simulated vegetable growing in simulated dirt is not a real vegetable. Only real dirt produces real vegetables, right? So in the same way, if consciousness is a property of biological organisms, why think that something that's not alive, a computer made of a completely different kind of stuff, silicon and little bits of, you know, copper and other things, why think it's going to have consciousness, which is as far as we know is a property of our biological brains? So the biggest assumption is premise one. And I actually think some interesting things happen with this, right? Another thing to keep in mind, we have yet to create a computer or anything that has consciousness, right? Now, interestingly, there's a Scientific American article. I'll, I'll link to it. You guys don't have to read it. There's a Scientific American article where they say that the odds are a little less than 50-50 we're living in a simulation. But they fudge a bit on this, right? So what they do is they actually say, well, you know, the author of this study agrees with, with um, Bostrom that three through four are really plausible. And he says, well, you know, one is the one we have no idea of whether a computer simulating consciousness will be conscious or not. You know, when you don't know if a, if a, when you have no idea what the probability of a statement of a claim is, just arbitrarily set it to 50-50. You don't know, just guess, eh, it's 50-50. Here's the thing, though. In the Scientific American article, that guess, that assumption of, ah, it's a coin flip, does all the work. If you assume that there's a 50-50 shot that computers can actually be conscious if they create consciousness, and you assume that all of two through four are very likely, then of course you're going to get something that's a little bit less than 50-50. 
basically you just multiply 0.5, 50%, by 0.9 with some nines after it a few times, the math gets you a little less than 50%. Here is my point with this though. Not just, hey, here's some fun with very basic math. My point here is how likely it is we're living in a simulation probably hinges on one, whether you think a simulation can create consciousness. If you are Bostrom, and Bostrom is very convinced of this, and he assigns, I think, you know, he's, he, for the sake of argument, he'll say, well, we're not sure. I think Bostrom is almost at 100% on this, right? Me, personally, I, I am very near a zero. I think it really unlikely that a simulation of consciousness would be conscious. I just don't think that's true. I'm pretty convinced by the Searle argument. Consciousness is a biological phenomenon. Why expect it in things that aren't biological that are completely different from the things we know are conscious? But look, smarter people than me think that that's stupid. They think that computers really could be conscious. If they're right, then the argument seems a lot more live contender. But here's a more general point. You should always be suspicious of claims about probability. Not, not I'm saying you should never believe them, but you should look very closely and ask very carefully how that person reached that claim. Because in the Scientific American count, the guy's just guessing, oh, 50-50 for, for number one, and we end up with, well, 50-50 odds, right? It looks exact, you know, they published this like, the odds are 50-50, here's some math. Well, the thing is, the dude's just guessed. He's plugged the guess in to an equation. Plugging a guess into some equation with some nice fun variables does not make your guess anything more than a guess, right? So, just because somebody can give you a formula just because somebody can give you a number, don't take that seriously at all. And just because they can give you a formula behind that number, well, plug, look into how they plug in the values in that formula, right? Think of the assumptions behind it. Anyway, I think the simulation argument is an interesting argument, right? I'm not sure how likely I think it is. I probably would not plug in the same numbers for a lot of these variables that Bostrom would. I think it way less likely than he does. Even I would put enough likelihood behind it that it kind of messes with my head, right? You know, I think the odds we're living in real reality are probably a good bit higher than 90%. Again, this is just Sam Duncan, though, plugging the numbers he guesses in for each of these. I'm not claiming to be an authority. But nonetheless, even if it's just 1% or 2% that everything we know is false, that still bothers me, right? And so in the next couple lectures, I want to look at, you know, basically the question of testing the simulation hypothesis. How might we do that? Some people have already done it. So far, it doesn't look like we're living in a simulation, but, well, that's all very provisional, and we'll say more about how seriously we should take that evidence. And we'll also, to finish up, ask how much it matters and whether we should want to test whether we're living in a simulation. If we are living in a simulation, well, might it not be dangerous to try to find that out? Think about how that might be. We'll talk about that in the next lecture.